Hi, I'm Lippy. And I'm Grumpy. Together we're Lippy and Grumpy do podcasting. In this episode, Grumpy's had a night in jail, a very short Westray flight, Lippy's house packing schedule, and lead shoes. Now, Lippy. Yes. I spent Saturday night in Oxford jail. I know. In an exciting way, not in a... (laughs) Yes, fortunately it's been turned into a very nice hotel. Yes, we were lucky enough to get a very long, I must say, video tour. Yes, Wife of Grumpy was very excited and we were in the House of Correction. Mm. Isn't that what a jail is, though? Well, there was a separate House of Correction. Well, I suppose it is, but um, this goes back a very long time. Yeah. So, but it was it was very pleasant, and we we rocked up in our classic mini. Yes. On Saturday, it just gone ten o'clock. Having had to return home from the petrol station in the village because the indicators wouldn't work. Oh no! And I'm sure they were working the week before. I don't remember them not working. And uh, there was no brake lights, no indicators. So I, I whipped the manual out, thinking it might be a fuse, and took the fuse out, pushed it around with my fingers, put it back in again. Worked fine. Nailed it. <laughs> Nailed That's it. That's a case well, of turn it off and back on again and see if it will happen. Very much like that. The problem is, is with the Mini, the fuse box, which is the same design as the one in 1959, except they've also added lots of inline fuses as well. So when a fuse mm-hmm. goes, it's it's pretty, uh, pretty horrific. Uh, but it was one of the main fuses, and they just fur over because they're quite exposed to the weather. So it was a sort of fairly good guess. If it hadn't been that, if it had been wiring, I think we would have been in a bit of trouble. Yeah, you probably wouldn't have been able to take the Mini, would you? No, probably not. But, uh, well, you know, it was fixed and we were on our way again in five minutes and no other problems. So that was That was very good. Okay. So anyway, so we rocked up at this hotel and there's a tiny amount of parking mm. available there for which you have to pay a princely sum, it has to be said. And um, we sort of navigated between these two very large Range Rovers. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, yes, uh, there's, there's Range Rovers, there's a McLaren in the corner, there's a Rolls Ooh. Royce with a with the number plate, something like Robert 8 on it. Uh, an awful lot of money in motor cars. And which cars get in most attention? Your little mini. Our little <laughs> mini, yes. I think mostly was, how did that big bloke get out of that tiny yeah. car? Uh, every time I see you in that car, I do think, I'm like, how do you fit in there? Well, I move the seat back, which helps. Mm. And I tip the seat back a little bit, which uh, gives you a slightly relaxed driving position. But yeah. When but you yeah. come up to traffic lights, it's quite hard to see the traffic lights. So you have to dip down a bit. Because <laughs> you're six foot two? Four. Six, six foot, foot four, four in a classic yeah. mini. Yeah. That's ridiculous. <laughs> Uh, well, it, it is. It works, obviously, because you travelled around Italy in it. So. Well, we've done three and a half thousand miles in three weeks in it, so obviously it does work. Mm. Anyway, so we had a very pleasant time in Oxford. I haven't been there for a very long time on the Saturdays. So we had a bit of a wander around. Uh, unfortunately, not very much in terms of old things were open. Yeah. So we went into a couple of churches, which was quite nice, and sat and had a coffee and watched people go by, which was very nice too. Yeah, I bet. Yeah, and had a a cracking meal in the prison. The only thing I would say is the lighting in the dining room was so dim. You couldn't read the menu. Dungeon-like. And people coming in with it. Well, it was very dungeon-like. But also, the lighting was in the middle, and we were on the edge. And as people are walking past, they're blocking the light out. (laughs) So many people have resorted to mobile phone torch Mm. to read the menu. God, that's almost as bad as dinner in the dark. It's not far off it, to be Mm. honest. Uh, the food, though, was absolutely cracking. Really very, very good. What did so, you have? Yeah. I had sea bass with chorizo, which is an Ooh. odd combination. Do you I think like, the chorizo like would the yeah, would overpower the sea bass? But no, it was it was a good call. Mm. Very good. And Wife of Grumby had a fillet steak. Which, Obviously. Yeah, I had a little bit of it. It was, it was very nice. Mm. Superb. Very nice so on the Sunday, we then joined the Mila Minis, which was a Italian job. Job. Any <laughs> jobs there? Tell job, job. So, fundraiser for Battle UK. And I think there was about 200 minis there, classics and binnies, as they're called, the good BMW minis. Very good turnout. I believe they've raised something like £18,000. Impressive. That's good, isn't it? 
Just a day event. Just a one day event. Yeah. yeah. Just just the one. Well, in fact, it wasn't even that. We left at ten and we got to the Moji Museum at I think it was about half past twelve. And having not got lost, but having to stop for the toilet. Oh yes. Yes, indeed. Yeah, so Buttle, amazing charity. It looks after children in poverty in the UK. Mm. So we tend to think of things like beds as a given, but some families don't have that basic necessity. So they do. They give grants to families that are in severe poverty. And it was set up uh, over 50 years ago by Frank Buttle, who somehow or other managed to save a million pounds before he died. And that million pounds funds the operation of the charity. Yes. So every penny they collect through donations is then goes Donated on to the kids. Fully, yeah. yeah, absolutely. There's no operating costs come out of that whatsoever, which makes it brilliant for that sort of event, like the mm. Italian job, because you can put a lot of effort in and you know all of that money is going going to, to help children. Um, but it'll bring with them a whole load of media coverage. We did uh, a tunnel job in 2019. So as we're getting onto the Euro Tunnel at Folkestone, they've got ITN there. They had ITN there, I believe, on Sunday as well. So we get yeah, there's lots of coverage for the charity, which is which is brilliant. So it was great to meet some friends of ours who we haven't seen for a while. Uh, we should have met up with most of them last August, but obviously that was cancelled for the obvious reasons. Mm. And I have to give a shout out to a gentleman I'm going to call Mini Matt. Mini Matt. <laughs> who's a, an avid listener of you and I. Yes. Uh, which is very, he came up, he said, oh, oh grumpy. Oh, yes. So Mini Matt's so cool because he has an obsession with minis. Mm. So not only does he have a, a glorious classic mini, he also works for mini as well. So does he's, he? uh, yeah, so it's 24 hours mini. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> And he's also lost a stack of weight as well. And well, so well done, Mini Matt. You're uh, Mini. Truly, truly Mini. <laughs> <laughs> truly through and through. So we're all looking forward to the next event, which will be the Minis at Goodwood on August Bank Holiday. Assuming all opens up and goes well. Fingers so crossed. That should be, that'll be good fun. So that's a little bit of on track action and then a. A poodle around the countryside around Goodwood, which is which is very lovely pleasant. countryside around Goodwood. It is lovely, yeah. Mm. So, and uh, and then a nice relaxed lunch with your mates. It doesn't get better than that. Sounds like a good day, to be honest. Even with the cars, <laughs> <laughs> it's all about people. Yeah, the cars exactly. bring people together. They it's, do. That they yeah. do. I know it's not your thing, but no. Uh, but speaking of cars. Oh, yes. We test drove the new electric oh, master yes. at the weekend. Yeah, how was it? The whole electric side was really cool. Like, you can't hear it. Well, you can hear it a bit, but it, it kind of just sounds like a little fake rocket going off. But yeah, super quiet. You do get quite good mileage as well. We had like 150 miles left with three quarters of a, not a tank, but three quarters of a, three quarters of a battery, battery yes. left. Um, so yeah, you get you can go quite far in it as well. But the car itself, it's just I don't on the outside it looks like you know the small four by four things that a load of yes. quite a few companies yeah. have brought out. It looks like it's meant to be one of those, but to open the back door you have to open the front door, so it's like dining room doors, you pull them both out. And the gap between the front seat that we didn't have that far back and the bottom of the back seats is so close together it just looks very cramped you get like a quarter of a window in the back and they don't go down yeah that's a bit of a Mazda trait the RX-8 which is an interesting car because it's the only production car that uses a rotary Wankel engine Mm. And that's always had these, well, not always, but the, the latest incarnation has always had these odd doors that open, as you say, like dining room doors, yeah. which is pretty cool. Uh, but it, there's not a lot of space in the back. And I guess they probably carried on that design feature. Mm. And yeah, and then they've gone for some su- sustainable fabrics inside. And it's just a mishmash of colours, really. It's black, grey, light grey, like a brown trim. And then there's cork in there as well cork yeah because apparently mazda used to be a cork company that wouldn't surprise me the slightest so they've put some cork in there <laughs> as well because it's all well i never crazy um but the actual the electric side of it was really cool and i think 
we probably will end up getting an electric car because it, it even like accelerating, you couldn't tell the difference between that car and my car. Oh, all, I actually think still... it accelerates considerably quicker than yours does. Well, you see mine go. <laughs> yeah, but the thing is that the engines are very different. So electric motor has the same amount of torque, whatever speed you're doing. Whereas a petrol or a diesel car has a fairly limited torque curve. So it will produce the most torque at a certain mm. number of RPM, which is not low down. Diesels tend to be a bit lower down. So you, you're getting much better performance. Yeah. But it does sound like you're in a hairdryer. Yeah. <laughs> well, it doesn't because you can't really hear it at all. Oh, well, that's obviously enough time talking about cars as um, Squadcast just very... <laughs> kicks very you out, to really? It. Kicks me out, Yes. <laughs> I don't know what caused that. It said there was no internet connection, which clearly there is, because 20 seconds later, we're back on. So. <laughs> yeah, so we better move swiftly on then. We better. We talked last week about the shortest commercial flight. Yes. Uh, 50 odd seconds between Westray and Papa Westray. Well, I, d- I did a bit more research. What I was really interested in was the cost of the flight, mm. which I failed to find. It, it doesn't seem to be listed anywhere. Apparently, it's heavily subsidised by the Scottish government, as are the ferries between the islands as well. I think the basis was is that you could travel between the islands for the same cost, more or less, as it would cost you by road if you did the same mileage. Oh, okay. So they are very heavily subsidised. Anyway, there is a flight a day from Westray to Papa Westray. It tends to leave around about mm, 10 o'clock in the morning or 9 o'clock on a Saturday. Mm-hmm. And it's listed as a minute and a half as the flight yeah. time. I guess you've got to do the runway bit, haven't you, and <laughs> taxi But around. also the wind plays plays a plays into this as well which is why the that's it 53 seconds would be in the record crazy depends what you read so i've got 47 seconds in one place that may be the quickest it's ever been done in uh 53 seconds somewhere else but i last week i kept going on about twatters yes because i quite like the word but it's not a twatter it's It's an islander no it's an islander they use which is a much smaller aircraft i think i'm going to still call it a twatter uh, yeah, but you'd be wrong, you see. If you came across somebody that knew their aircraft, I'd be like, no, you're wrong, it's an islander. Then I'll call them a twatter. <laughs> well, that would be very rude. So Logan Air run it, and they do have twatters, but they don't do that particular route with a twatter. And I think I talked about landing on a beach, but that's Barra, which is definitely a twatter. Uh, so they, so that's timetable for that's very dependent on the tides there. Papa Westray has 90 people living on it, but it's very popular with archaeologists. So there's 60 archaeology sites on Papa Westray. So Almost most as many pe- as the people. <laughs> well, that's very true. Very true indeed. So the majority of the passengers are, in fact, archaeologists. Hmm. So presumably they go there in the morning from Westray and then come back in the evening. But I couldn't find the return timetable. Now, there is a ferry that oh. goes there, which takes 20 minutes. It's not bad, is it? It's not really, no. But no. Uh, I still think I'd much prefer to... Yeah. Fly yeah, there. take the flight, provided you're not taking the car. Mm. And also, you, you don't have to be at the airport like an hour before the flight, because that would just be annoying. <laughs> no, be interested to see what the airport's like. Mm. I mean, imagine it's more of an airfield than an airport. I've definitely but... been to a few airports in my time that are, they are rogue. <laughs> yes, we went to, I think it was Mombasa we went to, and uh, we landed. And as you land, you see the wrecked aircraft at one end of the runway which doesn't give you much confidence to be honest Um, not being a particularly good flyer that's that's not a good sign no it's not not a boost is it we had to do there was an issue with our flights home from tanzania um so you fly from tanzania to kenya and then kenya back to the uk and there was some sort of issue where they overbooked the flight or something so some of us had to go from the main airport in Tanzania to a smaller airport in Tanzania, but by plane, because it's, it's not close by, it's quite far away, to then be flown from that airport to the Kenya airport. And the, the little mini airport in the middle was something else. Yeah, it, was, it was. It was just like a little shack with some benches in it. <laughs> yeah. We were stuck there for like two hours. They're coming round. They do the best sandwiches. I don't know what it was. They were the best sandwiches I've ever had. I think it's because the bread's slightly sweet. They were yes, amazing. possibly. So they just gave us as many sandwiches as we wanted while we were waiting in this little hut. So something else that happened last week, obviously with you 
imminent move, which we'll talk about shortly. Yes. Not yet. Wait for it. I got really excited then to see my face. No, not for it. (laughs) Is the confusion between Wi-Fi and the internet. It's not that. Do I have to get the diagram out again? It's not the same thing. It's just why. It's 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 not. People just call it Wi-Fi. It's your Wi-Fi. Yeah, but they're wrong. Yes, but it's common slang. Well, yeah, but it's wrong because the Wi-Fi not working is not the same as the internet not working. I still don't fully understand how that's not the same thing. If your Wi-Fi is not working, then your internet's probably not working either. Well, not necessarily. If the Wi-Fi is broken, the internet could still be working and vice versa. So you're saying if your Wi-Fi is broken, you could still connect to your internet? Yes, if you were plugged in, physically plugged into the router. I get the cable. it. I, honestly, the penny has dropped. Oh, Hallelujah. <laughs> I finally understand. <laughs> so your internet, you can like plug into your internet. So like when you're on your computer, you normally plug in. So I'm going to give this lesson once. <laughs> once more, you mean? <laughs> once more, yeah, true. I don't, uh, I don't imagine for one minute. It's the last time. So the internet dates back to the late 60s mm. and a project by the American Department of Defense called ARPA or ARPANET. And that was to produce a resilient network across the US so various military buildings could communicate with one another and you could take a little bit of it out and it would still work. So a little bit like the national grid. Mm -hmm. So that in theory, although in practice this doesn't seem to be the case, you can take a bit out and the whole thing works. It just goes a different route. So that was the idea for ARPANET. And then that grew into the internet as we know it. Okay. So... That, it, the internet is the physical wires and the switches and the routers that make the whole thing work. Websites are part of the World Wide Web, which is something that runs on top of the internet. Yeah. Okay. And that was developed uh, in the late 80s, very late 80s, by a British gentleman called Tim Berners-Lee. I get it. What we now have now is you have your house yes. is connected either by your telephone line, normally the telephone line, or sometimes a fibre optic cable, depending on your provider. Telephone line. So if it's telephone line, it goes to the local exchange. Mm. And that can be a combination of uh, copper only or copper and fibre. Yep. Okay, so fibre to the cabinet, copper to the house. That then connects you to the internet, to the physical internet. You have a box called a router. So you can have lots of computers in your house all talking to one another through Mm. either cable or cross Wi-Fi. But you then plug it into the router and it sends all the internet traffic out through your internet service provider, out onto the big wires all over the world. Got it. So most stuff connects wireless these days to the router, or you have a number of different wireless access points around the house or the office. So your connection between your device and the wireless or the Wi-Fi, although you then connect to the internet, is independent of the internet. They are not the same thing. I see. So that's also why you had to dial up. Yes, absolutely. Because it was the yeah. telephone wire that you were using. Absolutely, yes. And you would you would ring somewhere to with then be modem. connected. Yeah, I didn't know. I I obviously knew what dial up was, but I didn't know it was basically calling someone to be like plug in my internet. I mean, the most amazing thing I think is that we have two copper wires that go from this house to the to the um, box at the end of the road, mm. and those two wires will take a telephone call and stream three or four movies at the same time. And the fact that it works, I find, is utterly astonishing. It's very impressive. We've just ordered the internet for our new house. Jolly good. Yeah, super fast, optic. Don't even know. I didn't even... I left that down to Chris because he wanted to get some crazy fast internet that we can get at the new house, so... Good, so that's fibre to the house. I believe so, yes. I, I haven't got a clue other than it's... It's like 516 megabytes. Well, the network speed is measured in me- megabits a second or bits a second. That's it, megabits. Megabits. So that's one one or one zero coming along a piece of wire. So what, that's five, what's 516 mean? Well, you get 516 million bits mm, per second. God. We, ne- we, we hopefully shouldn't ever get any buffering because at the moment we have like 30 and we don't get buffering. Well, that's what I was coming on to next. Oh. <laughs> so when you're sat watching whatever it is on the television mm. or on your laptop, 
streaming service. The reason for buffering, there's many reasons for it. So it could be the wireless connection between your device and the nearest access point. So the further you move away or the more walls you put in between, the less power is in that signal Mm. and therefore the less data will come through it. So that that will cause buffering because obviously the screen is changing faster than the data is arriving at the device. I see. So that's one reason it could be slow. That If that access point is plugged into the router for a piece of wire, if there's a lot going on on that piece of wire or it's a very long distance, again, that could be slow between there and there. It could be slow between your router and the exchange. Mm. It could be slow between the exchange and the, the main trunk in the uk which then goes off to a server somewhere and there may not be enough capacity on that server which would slow it down there's so many bits that could cause it to be buffering oh so i feel like 560 paying for the extra megabits whatever it's a bit pointless it's not really because generally the slow bit is between you and the exchange Uh, okay whereas i think if it's who i think it is there isn't really an exchange you're going into whatever their local hub is. So we had a company here who were fibre opting up the village. Mm. Have they finished yet? Uh, Well, they've gone very quiet. Uh, Unfortunately, (laughs) lockdown seemed to get in the way a bit. Uh, So they came and installed all of the kit here. All of the road has been cabled with fibre optic, but they needed planning permission to put a box between our road and the next road. And they Uh finally admitted they had no idea when that would be granted. And I've heard nothing for a year, so oh. no idea what's happening. So we upgraded ours to fibre to the cabinet, which has been perfectly okay, actually. Anyway, here endeth the lesson. There'll Thank be you. no more confusion of Wi-Fi and internet ever again. <laughs> well, not from me, anyway. No, I suspect other people for may sure. still question it, yes. Anyway, we touched briefly on House Move, and I can assure you, listeners, there is not going to be a rant this week. There is not. I think I said last week that when we we had been speaking with our solicitors... You may have said it, and I may have edited it out. So, oh yeah, <laughs> I did, just, I did I just have to take quite a chunk out. Half got edited out because apparently I ranted too much. <laughs> it was a bit much. Apologies, but... When I get on a rant, I go on a rant. Anyway, I may you may have heard last week that when we spoke to the solicitors, she stressed me out a bit because she was like, oh, I could be calling you in the next few days to be like, oh, the move date is next week. And that is exactly what happened to start with. <laughs> Got a message through being like, um, so we can complete an exchange on the 28th of May. And I, I panicked. And Chris was like, let's just do it. Let's just do it. And I was like, okay. And so I said, yes, okay, that's, we'll take that day. And then they had to check with the sellers. And then I was sat there whilst I was meant to be working, absolutely panicking. Like we've got so much to do, so much to pack. And we've literally got a week. And thankfully, I think that it definitely is definitely the better way around because you guys were going to help us and you weren't around. I don't think I ever agreed to help. Mum was going to help. Mum volunteered you, so... That sounds more likely. <laughs> That's, you're looped in now. So, yeah, so they the sellers came back saying they couldn't... It was too soon. They couldn't yeah. move that quickly, which I think actually is probably... Although we would have liked to be moving this week, it is definitely a lot better that we've got now until the 11th of June to pack and organise and get stuff done and hire a van. Now, who even knows if there would have been a van free? Well, this is this is what we used to have when you know, if you're moving more and you've got removal men and you're in a small village. Actually, trying to get more than one person to have removal company on the same day in the same area is quite tricky. Booked a van in. That's a tick. Wi-Fi. Sorry, internet. Cute. <laughs> Already. <laughs> That's a tick. Because... Obviously, I'm going to need to work pretty much as soon as we move in. Although we've taken a few days off to organise yeah. stuff, I'm still going to need to work pretty much straight away. So we've ordered the box and everything so that we can just plug it in when we get there. And we've got Wi-Fi. So we're um, luring help by providing bacon rolls in the morning. Yes, I had that message. Yes. So Are you sure that 9.30 is early enough to start? We can only pick the van up at 9. And how long have you got it for? Until half four. Do you think that's long enough? We haven't got that much stuff, to be honest. You said this when you moved out of your flat. Yeah, so 
think of that amount plus like another 10 percent of that so what you're saying is that we're taking all the stuff we took to your to this place yeah plus and then there's 10 percent for chris that doesn't seem right well i made him get rid of his sofa and we've got my sofa we got rid of his bed and it's my bed okay we've got okay. a new tv it's, it's only well actually you need to bring the other tv it's two tvs i've sold it i put it on ebay no, storing it. it. But we don't have to take anything like fridge or... There's no wardrobes. That's staying. There's a few small chests of drawers. So but how are you going to hang your clothes up? Uh, we've got a wire rack as well. Uh, okay. So that's coming. Um, and the small chest of drawers, which then we'll obviously buy new stuff once we're in and painted. Okay. I, d- and I don't think we need to list out all of your house contents. <laughs> it's not insurance form. Oh, yeah, good point. But anyway, and then the week, then at some point, you're going to come and rip our ceilings down for us. Oh, good at ripping ceilings down. Yeah. Putting them up is a, is, is a bit tricky, but uh, ripping them down, yeah, that's... that's so that'll okay. be fun. You can rip down some ceilings. Good. I can, we, I can uh, supervise the ripping down of the ceilings with tea and coffee and biscuits. And picking up small pieces of plasterboard. Yes, and that... Good. Well, that's all exciting. So plenty of packing. So how's the colour coding with insulating tape going? Um, Very well on the two boxes I've done it on. Uh, How many boxes have you got in total? Uh, Packed, fully packed. Yes. We've got about, there's... I'm I'm looking for a number here rather than just the contents. There's there's about four upstairs that were packed from the previous time we were meant to move that we just never unpacked. Are you colour coding those? I will do once I take the tape upstairs. Okay. Um, and there's only two fully packed down here which have been taped. Okay. And the rest of them are half full. We're, we're going small, uh, more boxes. Lots of smaller boxes. No, yeah. yeah, more boxes with less in them. Yeah. We have got a tail lift, so that'll make the bigger things easier. But we, we don't... Oh, wanna... no, no, it doesn't make the big things easier. It's just a lot more fun. Yeah. <laughs> I thought there was a genuine reason why I needed yeah, a tail lift. it's more lift. fun. I literally said to the guy on the phone, I was like, I definitely need a tail lift. He was like, are you sure? I was like, yes. Well, the thing is, if it's a really good lift, you can jack the back of the van up on it as well by <laughs> keep pushing it downwards. But it's not my name on the form, so oh, that's fine. It's mine. The good. £500 well, pound deposit. Oh, wow. Well, it's worth it. <laughs> So obviously, if there are no boxes that are colour coded, then uh, I am going to be on at you all day. If you realise that <laughs> every box will be colour coded, but the furniture won't be colour coded because well, I'm how do hoping. We know where that goes? Well, I'm hoping you'll use your brain, see it's a sofa, and put it in the living room. Which one's the living room? Well, that's the thing. It's the, the room attached to the kitchen. The, it's, we're calling the kitchen. it the garden room. Well, Not the we've got a big room. open plan kitchen, dining, living, and then we've got a living room. I'm expecting something close to chaos on the 11th of June. It's fine because I'm providing some bo- some plastic cups so we can drink. Well, it's not proper china. Well, otherwise you've got to try and find it, haven't we? Well, that's why you, the last box you pack is the one with the kettle, the coffee and the cups in it. Yeah, but you can use a plastic cup. That's not very environmentally pa- friendly. I'll do paper then. I'll get paper cups. Even worse, the china cups. Nothing wrong with that. Preferably with a saucer. <laughs> I don't think I own a cup and saucer, to be honest with you. I think you probably should. But you can buy it as a housewarming if you want. What, cup and saucer? Cup and saucer. Housewarming? I'm going to buy some plasterboard. Yeah. Oh. oh, talking of plasterboard, mm. I was looking at uh, a thing called a dead man, which is an arm that you use to hold up one end of the plasterboard. Oh, yeah. And I know there's Chris and I, but it's actually it's quite hard work. So if you've got something that will take the weight of it... Yeah, you're no use whatsoever. <laughs> uh, and then I found these these plastic things made in Britain mm. that you uh, screw onto the sheet that you've already put up. So obviously you have to have one sheet in position. And you slide the board in. It holds it on there. It keeps the gap correct all the way along the board. So yeah. you're supposed to have a little bit of gap, presumably for expansion. And they're brilliant. Two of those, six quid absolutely perfect so i shall be getting some of those That's and good. also an attachment for the electric drill so you don't push the screw all the way through the plasterboard which i do every single time that's good as well then so, isn't it yeah and that was i think three pound from somewhere rather fairly locally mm. so yes yeah, so lots of gadgets to be had yes so that will be good it's just getting rid of the old stuff that's a problem we're going to use those bags hippo bags that's yeah. the one 
Yeah, excellent. Well, that will be uh, that will be a fun time. It will be lots of renovating tips coming soon. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so as long as it's not renovating rant. Well, I'll tell you what it'll be. It'll be a renovating tip after I've made a massive blunder. <laughs> Well, it's the only way to learn, to be honest. Yeah. I've done it many, many times. Don't worry. <laughs> Tipping plaster down the sink. Not a good idea. Don't do that. I don't think I would have done that even if you hadn't uh, said that, to be honest. Plaster's yeah, like I, cement, isn't it? it? It is a bit. I did it by mistake at about half past one in the morning when we were just desperately trying to finish the kitchen. Got it all clogged up. Just a little bit. But, mm. uh, anyway, so do you have a top tip for this week? I do. From my brain. From the lippy brain. From my Jolly brain. Good. So my top tip, obviously going to be house related, but it's kind of not house related. So my top tip is if you provide food, you're more likely to persuade people to help you do things. <laughs> That's very true. <laughs> it's very true, isn't it? That is very true. But also you have to provide food throughout the event, if mm. you see what I mean. Oh, yeah, yeah, So yeah. it's no good just having bacon rolls at the beginning. No, we've got because snacks. Because come... Well, Sandwiches. come twelve. Well, I'm expecting a sit-down meal at twelve. Well, I thought we were going for dinner after. Oh, are we? Yeah, got, there's a pub ten minutes down the road. Oh. So there'll be snack. There'll be bacon rolls, snacks. Maybe I don't. The the thing with the sandwiches is I don't know what people would want in their sandwiches, so I might just do snacks. Do you know what? At the mile of minutes, they gave us a, a little lunch bag each, mm. which was very good because we had a massive breakfast at the hotel. And in there was a plain old cheese sandwich, and it was glorious. Was it? Shall I just there do plain cheese sandwiches? Plain cheese sandwiches. I love them. The, the simplicity of those is, is mm. just Shall awesome. I make up a little packed bag so that you have your names on your bag? Well, that seems a little bit over-organised, to be honest. That's me, though. <laughs> well, yeah. Well, they'd be colour-coded as well when you wrap some tape around <laughs> and they have a... You can be red. Thank you. Okay. So, yeah, that's a the plan then. You'll have your own little bag with your sandwich and your snacks in it and your little water. Because you can buy water in cartons these days. Oh, can you? Mm. Do you not have it through the tap anymore? Well, when we get to the new house, I think we want to run the water a little bit. Well, they have had people living in there. There's... Well, I don't know when they moved out. We don't know if they've moved out soon. Oh, or... that's true, yeah. So you want to run it. Yeah. Well, just a little bit. Yeah, I guess. I mean, the water's sat somewhere in the system. It's not... What if you get really thirsty and we've just finished packing the house up? I drink a lot of water in the day. Well, I, I expect you to have packed the house up by the time we arrive, <laughs> to be honest, apart from a box with a kettle and cups and the coffee in it. The plan is to have everything downstairs and dismantled by Thursday evening. Excellent. Apart from the mattress, obviously, because we need to sleep mm. on that, and then we'll package that up into a bag that's got handles to make it easier. Are you going to colour code the mattress? No. Oh, that's a disappointment. And we had a top tip for me a couple of weeks ago to do with yes. WD-40. Yes. And I was very, very excited to see a YouTube channel that takes salvage cars and repairs them. Um, on their Instagram feed, they had a picture of a tin of WD-40 with a flexible straw attached to it. And the beauty of this thing is it works upside down, which has always been my beef with WD-40. If you try and do something at an angle, it just doesn't come out. You have to end up squeezing it into the lid and then tipping it. Mm. So this thing has got a flexible nozzle. So I used it on Saturday, just a bit of a spray around the distributor on the Mini. And it's it's fantastic, I have to say. Well done, WD-40. Oh, that's very, good, very well It's done. normally that yeah. long straight one, isn't it? And it's a bit... Well, you get the red straw that you lose within a week. Because yeah. it's stuck on with tape and it just you just lose it it's just the way of the world um unfortunately you can't refill these things so i feel there's quite a lot being wasted when you throw it away so my fact of the week fun so this fact. is a s- fun fact slightly odd one. Oh. so in 1948 a man wore 30 pound three-toed lead shoes and stomped around a florida beach during the night the footprints led people to believe that a 15-foot-tall penguin was roaming their lands. Now, why they thought it was a penguin and not something prehistoric, I don't know. (laughs) Penguins in Florida does seem a little unlikely. So he kept the prank up for 10 years, visiting various beaches. 
and the hoax wasn't revealed until 40 years later. That's crazy that it lasted that long it's, without anyone it's knowing. It's just brilliant. Well, it's people's ability to keep storm about it. Yeah. And it's it's like there is a photo of the Loch Ness Monster. Mm. That's a very grainy black and white photo um, taken many, many years ago, decades, decades ago. And the guy who took it admitted on his deathbed that he'd faked the whole thing. <laughs> so his mate had been in the water with something or other to make it look like a, a monster. And uh, and dashed the hopes of millions of Loch Ness monster hunters across the uh, across the world that oh. day. Which is uh, it was probably a bit of a blow great for Great prank, but, uh, though. Great prank. Absolutely superb prank. And last, yeah, lasted... Unfortunately... He owned up before he passed, mm. which I think is quite cool. See, I have a friend that works at a pub, quite an old pub, um, and one evening when he was working a late shift, videoed the um, CCTV cameras and dangled a piece of fluff in front of it. Oh, really? <laughs> which then ended up on the news as a ghost at the pub <laughs> and video evidence that there was a ghost going past the camera. I still don't think people know the truth. Oh, we do now. Well, but I didn't say who or which pub. Oh, very true. Oh, interestingly, where your grandmother lives in Sidcup, mm. there were sightings of five UFOs a week or so ago. Ooh. Somebody caught on on their mobile phone, which is quite hard to explain. Did they beam grandma up? <laughs> I think they probably would have sent her straight back, to be honest. <laughs> Yeah, she's about as kidnappable as you. <laughs> what was it somebody said? I'd hate to live in her brain. <laughs> yes. Well, I think probably that goes for most of us, to be honest. My brain is a wonderful place. It keeps me entertained, that's It does, sure. but a bit too much of it spills out, doesn't it? Yeah, my um, filter isn't quite quite working. No. That's it for this podcast. Thank you so much for listening. You can help spread Lippy and Grumpy's view on life by leaving a review on your favourite podcast platform. If you're not sure how to leave a review, or if you download from Spotify, there's some help at lippyandgrumpy.uk slash review. And if you would like to get in touch, email podcast at lippyandgrumpy.uk. So it's goodbye from me. And goodbye from him. Goodbye. Goodbye.